Amen. <clears throat> well, it's always good to be somewhere, isn't it? Good to be here. Glad to see everyone. And I was just about ready to stand up and tell Mike to get off my message. <laughs> he was meddling there for just a little bit. <laughs> but... Uh, I was preparing for today, then found out that I was only preaching in Fallon. I'm not preaching in Carson. So uh, I don't have to finish nothing. I can, I can do what I want. <laughs> and uh, recently I was in a series that I put together out of Second Peter. So was, go ahead and turn there. And... Uh, Second Peter chapter number one, as Brother Mike was uh, stating, uh, the current statistics on what we want to call biblical Christianity in our country states that 97% of Christians who claim to be Christians in our churches today have never led a soul to Christ. And statistics show that roughly 93 to 95 percent of professing Christians have never shared the gospel with anybody. If that's the case, what are we doing? Because if we're not here to share the gospel, what are we here for? Okay. As far as I know, our Lord doesn't need more potted plants hanging around. Okay. And no, we really don't need no folks to hold the chairs down. The chairs will stay right where they're at. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's that. In uh, 2 Peter chapter number 1, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, this is a precursor. We're going to start down at about verse number 8. And uh, I'm not going to get into the whole building blocks that he lists here, so... If you're there and able, let's go ahead and stand today as we uh, read God's word. Verse number 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he, he was purged, from his old sins. Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father help us this morning. Uh, help me. Uh, that's all I need to say. I need your help. We need your help. We need to see the face of God, we need the touch of God, we need the power of God, the presence of God, the things of God, the mind of Christ, everything you have, Father, we need. Help us today, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you're looking at Peter here, he... Uh, and Peter, we all know Peter, okay? He's the one that denied the Lord, took a swing at the servant, cut his ear off. And, uh, and lot, I've had some people say, well, why did he cut his ear off? Do you actually think he was swinging for his ear? <laughs> Nobody's swinging. If you're swinging a sword toward the head area, you're probably not going for the ear, Okay? Just saying, Peter was a fisherman. He wasn't all that great of a swordsman, <laughs> for which the servant was thankful. And the Lord would have healed up if he took his head off anyway. But sometimes we make some, we make some strange assumptions. We put some strange things together out of Scripture sometimes. That's why 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study. Amen. Study. Okay, you don't, you don't have to impress me. Okay, and your pastor is trying to teach you something. We've done the same thing, teaching people. Because here's the thing. When you're talking alone, the greatest obstacle you will face is the fear of hearing your own voice. Yeah. As a Baptist preacher, I've gotten over that fear. 
Okay, I don't fear that anymore. My wife says I can talk to a fence post. Okay, okay. and I talk to cowboys and stuff like that out in Winnemucca, which is very close. But the fact of the matter is, once you get past the fear of hearing yourself speak, because we, we don't pay attention, but as, as a church, when we're done here, we're all going to engage in some profane and vain babblings for about 15, 20 minutes after church, are we not? <laughs> and then eat. Yeah, my brother's got the priorities down. So if we can do that, surely I can stop by somebody in Walmart or somebody at Shields looking at ammunition with me. Okay, and I can start a conversation. If you're looking at ammunition, we can talk. <laughs> okay, if you're looking at ammunition or you're looking at guns, we, we, got, we, got, we got something to talk about. Okay, and it shouldn't take too long to bring that around to if your gun malfunctions and blows yourself up, where are you going? Or some semblance thereof. Why are you wanting to carry a sidearm? What are you afraid of? Okay, if we think about these things just a little bit, we can create avenues. Everything in life leads to the fact that we need a Savior. And Peter here, he begins talking about the growth and maturity of the believer. Because he says in verse number 1, To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He says, Grace to you according to his divine power hath he given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Verse number three. So, from, through God's divine power, he has given us, as believers, all things Amen. that pertain to this life Amen. and godliness. Yeah. Wow. Okay? So you don't need nothing. Once you're saved, you don't need nothing else. You have, been a, you have become a partaker of the divine nature. Okay, and if it's divine, it's from God, which means it's what? It's complete, perfect. It means you and I don't have nothing to say about it. But he gives us a list here, we're all going to get into that today, where he says you need to add some supplements to your body to make your body more able to communicate and use the divine nature that's been given you. And he talks about uh, adding to your faith knowledge and to your knowledge God. He goes through that list, that food pyramid. Okay, by the way, if you believe the food pyramid in the United States of America, I need to, I'm going to burst your bubble. The food pyramid was made up because all we had was grains in the 30s and they didn't have any meat, so they made a pyramid and said, you need lots of grains. Okay, the food pyramid's actually upside down. But anyway, that's a different message. But sadly, what we run into, the fact is, and I'm not going to take, I'm not going to take the poll here. Not everybody here eats right and takes your vitamins right, do you? It does not bring me great joy to sit down and eat broccoli. It does not bring me great joy to sit down and, and eat green beans. So I have a supplement that's just ground up greens, and I take a big scoop every morning to make sure I get the greens that I need. Why? Because more than likely, I ain't going to take time to eat them. Okay, but I have figured out I need them. They're good for me. Okay, now the fact is we're, we're all like that, and we have a tendency not to take those things and do those things that we know we're supposed to do. And it applies to spiritual life too. Where we don't have a tendency to take those supplements that's going to help me to be partakers of the divine nature in a more effective manner. And the reason that is, is where we're at today. Because he says, the seed of everything that God wants to do is in you. The divine nature. Okay? I need some supplements to feed it. Faith, knowledge, all those different things we'll talk about. Why? Verse number 8 says, because he says, if these things, these things were listed here, be in you, it's going to make you so that you are neither barren nor unfruitful. Okay? Because if we look at Christians in our country today, there's a lot of barren and unfruitful folks. I'm sorry. That's the fact. We have a hard time being honest with ourselves today, don't we? Okay? 
I am not a skinny man. Well, Never have been a skinny man. Okay. But people say, well, you know, you can't say that. But if I ask one of my preacher friends about, hey, you know, what do you think about, you know, people being overweight? You know? And I have one preacher friend, he said, dude, you're, I know five fat people and you're four of them. Wow. <laughs> well, we're talking honesty here. Let's be honest. Yeah. Young man was in the bathroom this morning, and I'm honest about it. I said, how you doing today? He says, I'm doing pretty good. I said, I ain't pretty, but I'm good. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not pretty. I'm not a pretty man. <laughs> okay? I have a shirt that I wear to the gym that says, touch my beard and tell me I'm pretty. <laughs> my wife got that on a dare for me. <laughs> okay? Nobody's been brave enough to try that. But if we have some brutal honesty, are we barren and unfruitful or not? Amen. And by the way, barren, in your Bible right there, that word, the literal, literal meaning is unemployed. Mm. Wow. Right. Yeah. Amen. Unemployed. As a Christian now, can we ask the question, are you employed in God's work or are you unemployed? Because because you got saved and trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior doesn't mean you're employed in nothing. Okay? When you got saved, your flesh didn't change. My flesh didn't change. My flesh still had the same desires it had before I got saved, after I got saved. Okay? As one preacher friend of mine says, if you had no character before you got saved, you still only got no character. It's going to take God some time to build some character. Because you're going to have to exercise those godly traits. But the Bible does say in Ephesians 2.10, we're real good about Ephesians 2.8 and 9, which is good. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, just the grace of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not saved by works. We're not saved, we're not, we're not a performance-based plan. But verse number 10 does say, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen. Well, what good works is that? I don't know. That's your problem. We're supposed to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. You know, I, I can tell you what the Bible tells you to do, everybody. Yeah. But what things God has you specifically to do? Right. Amen. I don't know. That's right. Amen. But if you'll do the general things God tells everybody to do, That's right. God will specifically call you to do something just for you. Because each one of us have been created in Christ with a specific ministry, with a specific purpose, with a specific calling. Amen. Why don't we get that? Because one of the popular things today is, well, you know, we were just all part of the body of Christ. We're supposed to just be here and be happy. Wow. Well, yeah, we're all part of the body of Christ. But there's a reason Paul in Acts chapter 20 went around and ordained elders in every church and encouraged everybody in every church. Because a universal invisible body does nothing. We have to have individual groups coming together with organization, direction, and purpose to say, hey, we need to do something with what God gave us. Amen. So from the beginning, it's not been this, this, we need to get back to the first century church thing. Okay, so we got those guys. And they had a big uh, food court night yesterday. We call it the LSD3 church. Well, it was the D3 church, and they went to a franchise church. They didn't want to be a... <laughs> They didn't want a denomination because there was someone in the middle, up higher for telling them what to do, so they didn't like the denominationalism. True story. So they broke off from that, Southern Baptist, and then they got involved with the Living Stones organization out of California. And if they pay them 10% of their tithe a month, they give them all the programs and everything, and they give them pastors. And then they, it's like, dude, <laughs> you left that and you joined that. It's the same thing. But now they can have the local bar bands come and play at the church. And they had the local uh, uh, beer and wine tasting tent out there. And they had a lot of people show up last night. Why? Because they don't have anything else. And by the way, there's no generational repeatability in that either. There's, there's nothing happening. When that dies, there's nothing left behind. That's why we don't have no preacher boys coming up. They don't, they don't have any preacher. I got those, those, those new age groups. They don't have no preacher boys coming up. So they're, they're, they're anybody who says, I think God wants me to preach. It doesn't matter who you are now. So he says, barren and unfruitful. Are we employed 
in the Word of God, in the work of God. And by the way, if you're not employed in the Word of God, you will not be employed in the work of God. Okay? I have to have instructions every day about what, when, where, how, and why I do what I do. Simple answer. Another question. How impressive are unemployed folks? Everybody here has an impression of unemployed folks. Okay? Now it's one thing. You all got businesses around here, and sometimes layoffs happen. We got gold mines. If, they, if their investment doesn't pan out, they're gone overnight. I remember in 2013, three families in my church, 90 men, running an underground mine up by Midas. Company went bankrupt. They had a job Friday. Come Monday, they were done. No work. Mine's closed. Okay? It happens. Now, these are gamefully employed men. All of a sudden, they're unemployed, but they're not comfortable being unemployed. That's right. Amen. Okay? And we've seen them. We've seen it happen. We may have happened to you. And so now you're out saying, hey, and we're praying. What, God, what, what, do, I, what do I do now? Because God always has a plan. Okay, and they got a job, and it went, took a week or two, maybe a month, and they're back to work. Okay? But now we have, in the day and age which we live, a group of about four, well, right now they say it's about four million American males in a category they now called not in the labor force. They're perfectly able-bodied to work, but they choose not to. They don't want to work. I don't know what they do, but they don't want to work. Okay? And I'm a firm believer what the Bible says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Nothing motivates me like hunger. Hunger's a good motivator. You get hungry enough, pretty soon McDonald's will do. <laughs> but see, we have a whole different attitude toward the two, don't we? Different viewpoint. If you're able to work and you're not working, what's wrong? If you're not able to work, are you looking for work? But see, some, again, in the Christian realm, if you're able to do something for God and you're not, what's your problem? Is there nothing around here to do? Everything in gospel light's done. There's no ministries to be done. Everything, everything's running like clockwork around here. We have no room for anybody else to get involved in ministry. Is that the case? I get a chuckle from there over there. <laughs> you don't need anybody help on the buses? You don't need no help in the King's Kids, in the Sunday School, Junior Church? Don't need no help anywhere? Or is it better than that we are unemployed. We could do something. But your Bible's very clear. It says, if you're unemployed in the work of God, go out and win someone to Christ. Because what happens is, it's not the way it's supposed to be, but it happens is, we win someone to the Lord, and we bring them to church and say, Pastor, I want someone to the Lord. <clears throat> Take care of them. And we do. But that's not the Bible prescription. The Bible says if you want someone to the Lord, they're your fruit, you take care of them. That's right. It's your responsibility to disciple them. It's your responsibility to say that they show up to church. It's your responsibility to see that they're doctrinally sound. Right. Well, I don't have time for that. Really? Then you're too busy. Yeah. Well, I'd ha I would have to cut out two and a half hours of my game time. I might have to skip around a golf. We have all these excuses. All our time is occupied, by the way, is it not? Yeah. Okay. And everything, every, every hour of every minute of every day of everybody around here is done in the most productive manner possible, correct? Because I, I can tell you, I, I, can, I, can, I can cheat, because on your phone, there's a little app in there that I can punch up and it monitors the phone use. How many hours of a day? How many hours during the week? How you doing? How did you do this week versus last week? I can punch that up and look. 
And I can tell how long you've been on Facebook, and I can tell long how long you've been on different apps. Okay? It's getting quiet. You're saying, now you're meddling, preacher. Okay, because we're, we're real good about spending our time our way. Okay, we're supposed to be spending our time God's way. Amen. I'm bought with a price. That's right, buddy. And the effects <clears throat> of the lack of our supplements we're talking about here, lacking these things, it says, number one, we're blind. We cannot see afar off. What else does he say? Cannot see for hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. See, what happens is when we don't spend our time being employed by God, we forget where we're going. Right. We sing that song, this world is not my home. Right. I'm just passing through. Amen. I'm trying to drag everything I can get to heaven when I go. That's not how that song goes. Amen. <laughs> Timothy was very, Paul was very clear to Timothy. He said, son, you brought nothing into this world, and guess what? You could take exactly that out. Amen. But most Christians live today like, Lord, don't come back. I haven't seen the Grand Canyon yet. I have my vacation planned, Lord. What if I miss the Grand Tetons? If heaven doesn't overshadow everything in God's creation on this earth, God's lied to us. <laughs> or is that just me? If everything in this world isn't a distant bad memory in heaven, why are we wasting our time? If Jesus said it's so valuable that you need to lay up for yourself treasure in heaven and forget about this world and not be, not be affectionately attached to this world, is he lying? Is he kidding? Is he joking? Or is he serious? Because we got such a tight hold on this world. Well, I'm ready to go to heaven, but I just got to get that yard sale this afternoon. Yard, that's one of those things that just, just baffles me. You try to sell the stuff you're going to throw away because you haven't seen it in six years. And someone comes over and buys your junk and goes and throws it in their, in their storage unit. Because they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they already have a storage unit full of junk. But we have now, we have stuff now. And we judge we, whether we use the stuff, see the stuff, or whatever, but, but I have stuff. And the more stuff I have, the more, the more what? The more prominence I have in the world? The more stuff you have, the more stuff your kids have to fight over and squabble over when you're dead. And by the way, I, I have done one funeral more than I'd like to do. I'll do more, but I'll tell you what, this last few years I've done some funerals for some lost folks because of my longevity in Winnemucca, and I've known as Pastor Mott in Winnemucca, I've done some funerals that I didn't really want to do because there were lost folks died in their sins, but their family had nobody, they have no, they have no pastor, they have nobody around, so they came to me. And all I can do is preach the hope of Christ out of John chapter 11 for those that are living, and pray to God nobody asks me about the person that's dead. Because yeah. 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 I ain't going to tell you he's in heaven. Yeah. And I'm not going to tell you he's in a better place. Because right. that person who died without Christ would do anything to be alive in this world again. That's right. That's right. But we Christians, we live like, we live like this, this world's gonna, we're going to miss this world when we're gone. And we're supposed to live like we'll be glad when we're out of this place. Paul said, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. But we get so grabby. We get attached to things. You know, we had a couple families in the church. Cameron was late to men's breakfast yesterday morning. He said he was getting ready to go, and he looked up, and two little stray kittens come wandering down the driveway. So he had a decision to make. He has a Rottweiler and a German Shepherd. He said, I can just turn the dogs loose and pretend I didn't see them. <laughs> but by the time while he was making this decision, his little girl, Violet, came out. Oh, daddy, kitties. 
<laughs> said he should have just cut them dogs loose and forgot about it. <laughs> Can't control the dogs, honey. Sorry. You say whether you, you'd let them eat the kittens? <laughs> Is this a conversation you really want to have with me? <laughs> I understand. But I, I raise food. I have sheep and I have cattle. I have a steer. He's going to be ready for butcher next spring. His name is Sir Loin. Okay? And my lambs that are going to be butchered this fall, they don't have lambs. Okay? And I just keep my wife away from them. Why? Because they're still little cute and fluffy and all that kind of stuff. And my wife would go, oh, he's so cute. No, 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 no. My ram is named Noah. Why? Because he's not food. He produces food. Okay? So we just got to keep our minds about these things. Okay? They got this whole thing where the vegans are putting stickers on meat. You know, like, the, her name was Emma and she wanted to live. You know? I collect those. <laughs> I, think, I think that's hilarious. If I can find those stickers, I'll collect every one of them. You know, this, this little pork chop's name was Georgie. He wanted to live. Well, Georgie's delicious with barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> and you ain't hurting my feelings any. But I can tell you this. Best thing to do with kale is to saute it in coconut oil and bacon grease. Because it slides out of the pan a lot faster into the trash. Because that's all that's good for. See, we get blind, we forget what we're here for, where we're going. We start grabbing things we shouldn't be grabbing. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, then we forget that we were purged from our old sins. Why? Because that, that, that's when the old paths, the old sin, the old flesh comes creeping back in when we forget where we're going. Wow. See, it, it, there's no new sin that's going to trip you up. The devil's going to get you to forget where you're going so you'll go back to the path you came from. It's the familiar path that you're comfortable with going back to sin that the devil wants you back on. Right. Okay, he's not gonna, he, he, if you've never done dope, he ain't going to come and say, oh, man, you need some cocaine. He's like, no, I don't need that. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. But, it, but if you've been a Christian and you've, never been, and you've never really been in sin in your life, he you never had those opportunities, he will bring into a judgmental pride and arrogant heart yeah. where you start looking down at those people over there. If those people over there would just get their act together, which one's worse? My Bible says they're both the same. If a man knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I don't care if you can see your sin or not, sin's sin. The Pharisees looked really, really good. And Jesus had the biggest problem with them. Okay, people, I have, I have a big problem with people who are, well, you know, if you just come over to our place and and get your life straightened up and get baptized in our baptistry, your life would be so much better. No, probably not. Probably not. Well, get yourself cleaned up and get into church. No, get into church and God will do the cleaning. Amen. Okay, that's what he did to me. So we forget these things. So we have to, we're supposed to be employed in doing something. And if you go back to uh, 1 Peter chapter number 2, <clears throat> He's going to give us another problem because if we're not engaged in these things we see here in 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, we have something else happening. We forget that we were purged from our old sins, 1 Peter chapter number 2. Verse number 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Lord, they may grow thereby. If so, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. See, we're supposed to feed this. This flesh needs fed. Our spirit needs fed. Okay? And by the way, you only have so much hunger. You only have so much of an appetite. That's, that's fact. Okay? And your appetite, by the way, changes over the years. It's going to change. Okay? I remember when I was, years ago, when uh, our pastor in my first in Kansas asked if the boys, my boys could come over to his house. And I don't know how normal boys eat, okay? But mine was kind of like feeding 
piranhas. <laughs> you just threw the food out there and got your fingers back because you're going to lose something you get in that plate. Okay? Because this is the way it worked with, with box cereals. Box cereals didn't exist in my house. Amen. After this day, my oldest two boys, Michael and James, went into their kitchen, grabbed their mom's mixing bowls out. Each one of them emptied an entire box of cereal in that bowl, filled it up with milk and ate the entire thing, then come back and asked me to make them some breakfast. <laughs> and I said, nah, we ain't doing this. <laughs> No, we, 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 just, we just went straight to the pancakes, bags, eggs, and oatmeal, and just stuff that fills them up. Okay? So you only have so much hunger, and that hunger is going to change, and, and you, that hunger can be satisfied with good food or not so good food, right? I mean, we're going to get done here, and we're going to go fellowship, as our brother said, and we're going to go eat. Why? Because that's what we do. We're Baptists. We eat. We're good at eating. Back in Winnemucca, today's Hot Dog Sunday. It's the last Sunday of the month. We do what we call Dinner on the Ground Sunday. So we have a morning service. We have fellowship. We have our afternoon service. We're done. Okay? So you, never, you don't ever leave, have to leave the grounds. And today's Hot Dog Sunday. So they're going to have hot dogs and all the fixings and all that kind of stuff because we start our uh, baseball-themed vacation Bible school tomorrow. So they're out there, and they're going to be eating hot dogs everywhere. Okay? And good hot dogs. Kosher beef hot dogs. I told him, you bring a turkey dog into my church, or we're going to have a talk. Yeah. You don't be bringing no turkey dogs into this church. Don't be doing that. I, I, almost, I almost had to terminate one of my, one of my interns years ago, and back in 2013, Jonathan Montgomery. We were in Bible school, and we ran out of hot dogs, and he shows up with turkey dogs. Amen. And I was like, son, it's like I've never known you. <laughs> never known you. But you got you know, you know, you to have priority. You, you know, we have standards, right? And I was talking to someone the other day about standards. I, I have a standard in my house. I have at least 10 pounds of bacon on hand at all times. And my wife's rolling her eyes at me. She goes like, yeah, I know you have to. In my deep freeze, I have 10 pounds of bacon on hand. If I get under that, I'm, 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 looking, I'm shopping for bacon. Why? Because you don't know what's going to happen. You're going to need some bacon. And if you have a recipe that calls for a pound of bacon, you're going to need a pound of bacon to snack on before you get to that anyway. And I, and I, had, to, I had to make men's breakfast the other day, so I made a pancake uh, breakfast bake. Pancakes on the bottom, scrambled eggs. Then I wove a bacon blanket and baked it in the oven and put the bacon blanket down in there. Put the cheese over that and covered the top with uh, pancake batter and baked that whole thing together. That yeah, was gone in about three seconds. It was like, <laughs> see, see you're, all, you're all hungry now, aren't you? <laughs> but see, what he's talking about here, those first things of the flesh are the things he says you need to get rid of that because that's going to kill your hunger for the things of God. Okay? That first number one, he says, if you get, don't get rid of that, you're not going to have a desire for the milk of the word. Why? Because you only have so much hunger. Okay? Because, let, let's face it, you want to break this down a little bit here? A Christian that has malice toward other people isn't interested in feeding on God's word and learning about the love of Christ. Amen. Why don't you just get rid of those people over there? We're not supposed to have malice toward people. Okay? We're supposed to hate sin. Guile. We're not supposed to be like that. We're not supposed to be like that. Hypocrisies? Now, I could ask, I could ask a question because 100% of us in here today are guilty of hypocrisy. Why? Because you're humans. You're humans. You know? Because, you know, we, we get out of here, we, we, could, we could talk about the commercialism, what's going on. We're talking about Christmas in, uh, in July. I think that's a great idea. Best thing you do at Christmas is July is roast about an 18-pound rib roast. On the Traeger with a good, good, good bunch of rosemary and spices and garlic on there. Get it up to about 140 degrees so it's still nice and red in the middle. Then just douse that thing in horseradish and have at it. That's good stuff right there. That's what you eat for Christmas? Yep. Thanksgiving I do, well, it should be obvious. Thanksgiving I do a bacon-wrapped smoked turkey. 
I wrap that thing. My wife looks, she usually looks at that. But, yeah. but guess what? My church wants every Thanksgiving. Pastor, you making turkey? <laughs> That's good. So, hypocrisies. We're all guilty of hypocrisy, but we realize it, we see it, or we should sense it, and we should then repent of it and get away from it. But we're all guilty of it. Okay? And it's not supposed to be part of our lives. It envies. Well, if we had a better preacher, if we had this, we had a better, if we had a better building, if we had a better Bible, it, it, what's your problem? Go back and look at the apostles. Judas had the Son of God in his life for three years Amen. and still never got saved. <laughs> still betrayed him, still sold him out. Peter spent the same time with him and still denied him. What's our problem? Our problem is we're looking for any excuse not to be employed in the work of God. And evil speakings. It's hilarious as, I don't know, we, I don't know, we call ourselves fundamentalists. Some of the other Christian sects out there call us fundies. But they, they'll, they'll get up on their soapbox, the other churches and stuff. Oh, those fundamentals always over there. Blah, 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 and they'll, just, they'll, they'll run you into the ground. They'll run me into the ground in a heartbeat. Then they'll come back. Next thing goes, we're supposed to be kind and loving to everybody, you know. <laughs> Unless there's someone that has a higher standard than you, then you can by all means attack them. Right? Okay, that's number one. Hypocrisy is number two, evil speaking. Because I'm not supposed to speak evil, my brother or sister. I don't know if those folks are saved or not. It's none of my business. Yeah. But if they preach the gospel and they're, and they're, they're saved, they're my brother and sister, and then i got no business speaking evil against them. <laughs> and I'm not even supposed to speak evil against our leaders. Yeah. Right. Okay? You know, might send me some depends or something, but... We're supposed to pray for our leaders. But see, we only have so much hunger. And here the, he asks the questions, if so that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Is, has God been gracious to you here? Can you look at your life and say, God's been gracious to me? Then get rid of the flesh stuff and start feeding the spirit with the sincere milk of the word. But where we, we need a... Holy hunger. Amen. The only way we get a holy hunger is when we stop feeding the flesh and let the spirit get hungry. Right. Anybody here have been around a baby? Since we all was one once upon a time, <laughs> and you're all here, number one, I can tell you, you was, number one, you were born from a woman. Okay? And you screamed and cried when you were hungry. Yeah, right. Now, I know how my boys did. I don't know. How, maybe you guys have different, had different uh, children than I did. But when one of my boys was hungry, they screamed and they didn't shut up. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Any of your, your, your newborns go, oh, mommy? <laughs> Leche, por favor. I don't think that happened. Yeah. No, it went kind of like this. Yeah. And it didn't stop until what? Until that hunger was taken care of. When's the last time we, we actually cried out to God and said, I need something more than what I have, God? Because right. when I'm employed in the work of God, what happens when you work hard? You get hungry. <laughs> you get hungry. When you're working hard, you get hungry. When you're doing something, you get hungry. Yeah. See, it all ties together when we make sense of this thing. And if all we're doing is sitting around in our flesh, feeding our flesh, our spirit forgets that it's hungry. We forget the spirit's hungry. And we forget to feed it. And it gets hungry. Babies want to eat. And recently there was a, uh, a thing in the news where a woman threw a couple bottles in a playpen and left her 
baby there while she went on vacation, thinking the baby would just eat those bottles and ration them out for the next 10 days. And that little baby starved to death. Thankfully, the woman went to prison. But the problem was she saw absolutely no pr problem with her actions. She thought she was being perfectly reasonable. And taking a 10-month-old baby and just throwing a couple bottles in the crib with it, thinking the baby would be fine for a week. That's a disgusting thought. How do you think God looks at us when you come in and say, well, I'll just give the preacher an hour on Sunday and then uh, I'll be back next Sunday to get a little bit more? I wish I could give you a week's worth, but you ain't got that much time. And if I do give you a week's worth of food today, by Friday or Saturday, you ain't going to remember everything I give you. That's why Jesus said you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. We need daily food. I always remember that, Miss Stella Ralston, when I'd go preach for Brother Ralston over there, Miss Stella always made my wife and I stay with her. Sweet, sweet lady. Love Miss Stella. But she had that sign in her kitchen, when you come down for breakfast, it says, no Bible, no breakfast. And you think, oh, that's a pretty sign. But when I came down, she'd look at me and say, Pastor, have you read your Bible yet? <laughs> Because if the answer was no, she said, well, as soon as you're done, breakfast will be on. <laughs> See, she, was, she wasn't joking. She wasn't joking at all. We set our priorities right. And here's the thing. See, a lot of Christians, we live on bad luck, good luck, so on and so forth. But the problem is, if we're not in the place where God can bless us, you're going to miss God's blessings. We don't live on luck. We don't live on fate. We don't live on, on karma. We don't live on any of that. We live on God's blessings, God's grace, and God's mercy. Amen. But when we're messing around in the flesh and messing around in a place, we, we're, out of, we're out of sync. And my boys are just like I was. I was raised Midwestern home. We didn't have money. Mom fixed dinner. Mom set the dinner on the table. She called my brother and I, boys, time for dinner. We'd come in and sit down. And we'd look at it and say, I don't like that, Mom. She said, well, here's your options. Eat it or don't. <laughs> well, I want something different. There ain't anything different. <laughs> That's what's for dinner. And my boys are the same way. My son James sets everybody down for dinner. I don't like that. Eat it or don't. Okay. Well, I want something different. There isn't nothing different. You have, we, have, we have the eternal word of God. You don't need anything different. Amen. Well, this one's hard to understand. No, it's not. And if it is hard to understand, study to show yourself approved unto God, workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what I learned to study? When I hit college. My first year, I, well, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't go to Bible college. I went to University of Nebraska. I was a straight A and B student. I coasted through high school like it was nothing. Why? I was smarter than my own good. I was too smart for my own good. I got to college. I got into calculus. Okay, and my first semester score in calculus was a 1.7 on a four-point scale. And I was like, what's going on with this? And my professor says, looks like you need to study. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> then I learned to study. Why? Because I was running into things I didn't understand. And I had to work at it. And by the time I had to take Calculus 3, the demented, twisted professor gave us a month and gave us three questions to do in a month for our final exam. Okay, which I just barely got done. Why? I had to. Study. And then I had to get into quantum physics and all. Yeah, yeah. There's some stuff out there. There's some. Yeah, there's some stuff. You get into Ezekiel and Daniel, and you start dotting your eyes and start linking that up with what's going on in Isaiah and what's going on in Revelation. You're going to have study. 
But with what we see going on in our world today, Christian, we need, we should be expert on what we see going on here. And by the way, if you're going to be a good testimony and open up doors to witness for Christ, if you understand the Bible connection to what's going on in the world today, the fact that they opened up a one world religion center, that they're already working on a cashless society, if you understand how that correlates to Revelation and Ezekiel, everything's going on, that's an easy conversation starter right now. All this weird weather going on. What's going on with that? Well, let me tell you about that. All the flooding going on in the Midwest. I-29 coming out of uh, Omaha, Nebraska today uh, by the Missouri River. I know that. I go to, used to travel that all the time, go to my grandma's house. It's under two foot of water this morning. You know what else is going to happen? Where does the Missouri River go? It joins the Mississippi River right there at St. Louis. So is that all that flood water coming down from the Dakotas and Minnesota hits that? It's going to come down pretty soon that it's going to hit that Mississippi River. Yeah. And it's still raining. And it's flooding. Well, you say, you go back in your history. What did God do to Israel? He's trying to get their attention. Sent natural disasters, floods, pestilence, droughts. Yeah. You ever seen a Mormon cricket? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my good friend of mine just, just planted his garden here about a month ago. Had everything up. Had little beans up and little corns up. And he went out. To, he has a, he's, out, he's a hunter. He's out scouting for hunting. He'd come back home. And a swarm of Mormon crickets come down. He said covered the back of his house. He couldn't see the door. And he said all he saw was his garden plants. <laughs> They'd come in and just snip the leaves off, and away they go, eating this, ate the thing to the ground. And, and we still think, well, you know, it's global climate change, Pastor. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I can go into the science and prove that to you, but we're not going to do that right here. But what, what God's trying to get us to do, what God's trying over and 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 over to do, what he tried for 400 years in Israel in the Old Testament to do is get them to have a spiritual hunger again. People today just aren't hungry. Well, we're too fat and happy. We got the air conditioner on, you got padded pews, padded seats, we got a piano, we got music, we got everything, we're just, we're comfy. I watched a church from Uganda. Islamist militants came and burnt their church down last week. Burned it to the ground. You know where they were? They were back in their church. Had four walls. Everything else was burnt to a crisp. And the pastor went back, brought his people back, and had church in their church. With nothing left. But they decided they were going to keep serving God and go to church. I've watched Filipino churches with two foot of water from a, some sort of typhoon wade through the water, sit down in their little plastic chairs and have church. How full would we be around here if the air conditioner quit and people start smelling a little off? See, see y'all need to spend more time in the real world. See, I, I, used to, I used to work with European folks, for folks from uh, Vienna, Austria, and the Netherlands, and Norway. You say, what's, what's that? They don't use deodorant. And they all smoke like a chimney. They smoke a pack, pack, and have a day. So it smells like a smoky armpit all the time. <laughs> you, spend, you, need some, you, need to, you need to be in touch with the real world. Okay? And... and, and, and since when did serving God become about personal hygiene? I, I, I think personal hygiene is great. I'm, I'm glad I got a shower in my house. But if I, got, if, I got, if I got to get cleaned up at the garden hose in the backyard, so what? See, we, we put all these conditions. Well, as long as it's comfortable, as long as it's in my time frame, as long as it's in my schedule, I'll give God 100%. Well, you just told me you're not going to give God 100%. Because if I'm going to give God 100%, if it's inconvenient, if, it, if it's not right, if it doesn't feel good, if it's too hot, I'm going to still do it if I'm giving him 100%. Because a lot of people say, well, I'd, I'd, I'll go out, you know, sow one in the, in the fall and in the winter, but in the summertime, it's just too hot. I'd, I'd burn, sunburn my head. Put 
add-on. Take a bottle of water. You need a bottle of water? We've got a stack of them under here. We'd come up with, but if we have a baseball game to go watch, we'll gear up pretty quick and be out there. See, the fact of the matter is, the priorities, our priorities are already set. That's right. Right. Hebrews 5.12, and I'll close with this. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. See, the point of our Christian life, the point of our physical life, the point of our physical life isn't just to exist until we die, is it? No, we, we, we learn. I have to learn. I, I crave to learn. I want to learn stuff. Okay, I, don't, I don't care. Okay, my wife sews. I know how to fix sewing machines. Okay, do I like to fix sewing machines? No, those things are a nightmare. <laughs> okay? But when my wife first learned to sew, she didn't, we couldn't afford to go to a sewing machine repairman, so she said, she brought a book from the library and gave it to me and says, learn how to fix my sewing machine. Okay? I can fix a car, I can fix a tractor, I, 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 I can do a lot of stuff. Amen. I want to learn. Yeah. And by the way, I want to apply that to my spiritual life. I want to learn more about God. That's, right. and that's what he says here. If there's a time, every, every Christian is designed by God to be a teacher. That means if you are saved here today, you have been designed by God to teach somebody something about God. Because he says that you ought to be teachers. Right. And what happens is we don't have this divine nature growing in us, so again we forget and we come back to being a babe. Being a babe. And we have different words for it. Because if we have a 30-year-old person who still only can speak in small sentences, talks like a five-year-old, has to be cared for, can't take care of themselves, can't feed themselves, we say that person is handicapped. Okay? And there's legitimate reasons for that. I'm not, I'm not downplaying that at all. I'm saying that, that that happens. I know people like that. They have some mental or physical infirmity. And that's a fact of life. But a perfectly able-bodied Christian who still must be spoon-fed every week by the pastor yeah. is just like that unemployed person who's perfectly able to work. If Christopher shows up back home and says, Mom, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to work anymore. I need you to take care of me. And, and by the way, bring me some milk and cookies. <laughs> that brought a laugh. <laughs> and it should. And it should. I, I recently listened to a podcast and a young man who was in his mid-20s. And it was about being a man, podcast was, and, and being an adult. And the young man says, I, I live out on my own. I, when, the, when I heard his voice, I was like, ah, this ain't going to be good. <laughs> I live out on my own, but I still have to have help from my mom every month to pay my bills. Oh, wow. He says, I don't, you know, you're saying that, you know, an adult needs to be out there taking care of himself, being, you know, making his way in life. He says, I work a full-time job 12 hours a week. And the guy's like, well, wait. <laughs> He's like, well, I can only work 12 hours a week because of my anxiety. And the man's like, anxiety? <laughs> He's like, son, being an adult is all about anxiety. <laughs> He's like, if you can't deal with anxiety, you ain't an adult yet. But we live in this world. Oh, I'm feeling anxious. <sighs> yeah. Welcome to life. <laughs> Welcome to life. I've been over to see... Uh, Nick over in uh, Elko as they start Ruby Baptist Church. And there's been some anxious times. I remember when I started out here, moved my family out here, got to Winnemucca, Nevada, and said, where am I living? They said, oh, we, we, we haven't found a house for you yet. 
Oh, well, where are we having church? We, we don't have a church. <laughs> it got a little anxious. But if feeling a little fear and being a little anxious stops you dead, go back and read Joshua. When God's prepping Joshua to go into the promised land over and over and over and over again, God says, be strong and of a good courage, I'll be with you. Be strong and of a good courage, I'll be with you. You go forward, you remember my word, you remember what I've said, and you go forward. I don't care if you're anxious. When the prophet got all down, prophet Elijah went under, a, uh, went under the juniper tree and said, just kill me now, I'm the last one. Did God come and say, grab his hand and say, oh, you poor little thing. I'm so sorry you're feeling like this. No, the angel came and kicked him and said, get up and get something to eat. We got work to do. There's not, there's not a sympathetic verse in your Bible where God says, I'm so sorry, Job, this happened to you. What God did say was, are you God? Do you understand what I'm doing and how I do it? Then don't question me. You got no business complaining to God on your Facebook page. Oh, you wouldn't know what's happened to me today. Nobody cares. I learned that a long time ago. You get, you get out there trying to find some sympathy somewhere. Half the people you tell your problems to are glad you got them. And the other half don't care. The only one that cares for me is the one who gave his son for me. The only one that's going to help me is the one who helped me. And he says, I've given you everything you need in my divine nature. Now it's up to you to supplement it with what's needed to make that divine nature rule your life. Right. Otherwise, we become useless Christians. And that's not, a, that's not a thing. There's no prescription for a useless Christian. We're supposed to be employed in the work of God. Let's have our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. If you're here today, in order to be employed in the work of God, you've got to be in the family of God.